Good. So again, hello everyone. Welcome to the second day of the workshop for senior researchers. Today uh, with us is Manfred Mugluze and he will uh, tell us more about occurrence rate estimation of climate extremes. After that, we will have a short um, coffee break and then do the practical exercises uh, and then have a discussion uh, about that. Uh, we put the, uh, uh, the, the data on the OneDrive in the folder name Manfred Model Z, second day Manfred Model Z. So you can download the, the data that we already prepared for this session. And um, I wish you all a um, nice time and a productive, productive exercises today. So Manfred, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning. So my name is Manfred Mudelsee. I think you know me in the meantime. And actually, we are sitting in the same house, in the office house of my company, Climate Risk Analysis. Viljana is just uh, in the next room, and it's very funny. Just uh, 10 minutes ago, we had a coffee, and now we, we do this online stuff. Uh, and, and they are here already since the uh, preceding week, and we do joint analysis of um, well, of climate extremes, of heat waves or extreme floods. And with her is also Vigor Lechersen. And uh, it's very uh, fruitful scientific interaction with those two. So I very much enjoy them being here. And I can attest, uh, I'm, we are all waiting for the times when this COVID is over and we can work uh, in person with each other. This is uh, very productive. And uh, yeah, I know that I miss this and I'm looking forward to working with you all um, in person in the future in this wonderful project, Extreme Climate Twin. As uh, Biljana mentioned, this is now the third workshop. That means we, we, we work on the analysis of climate extremes on treating um, data. We learn a bit about the uh, theory, but since this is now the third workshop, that means there have been two already and I lectured on, on both. And I gave you already, I think, your copies of the, the book, which you see here, the Climate Time Series Analysis book, the blue book. Um, I will use this lecture more to give you some um, background information or point you to um, important uh, aspects of the analysis of climate extremes. I assume that most of you are familiar with most of what is in the book. And, um, but if not, if for any reasons you, you fail to immediately understand what I'm speaking about, let me know, interrupt me and I'm happy uh, to again walk you all through this. So the, the slides I put on, occurrence rate estimation of climate extremes, these are based on the, on the course on climate extremes. And I, I, as I said, I will put a focus on chapter six, the extremes. And also from that uh, chapter, we have a focus on the non-stationary um, um, uh, section. Yeah, because with climate change, we can assume that many things, many climate variables, many properties of climate means extremes, variability is also changing. I go even so far to say that stationarity is obsolete in these decades of climate change. It's therefore we put a, the focus on the non-stationary um, stuff. So I will go to the Next slide, and uh, well, usually I welcome the people uh, which come offline or online to my courses that we study climate from different angles. I come from physics and I look uh, on problems, on scientific problems with a quantitative eye. And also I want to understand the, the theory of the system which generates the data, generally speaking. In this case, I want to understand climate. And therefore I analyze climate data. So this is then a concept from, from statistics. So statistics is the science um, of data. And uh, 
and because it's, uh, it's, it's data from a natural system from the climate, uh, they are affected by, by noise, uncertainties in the measurement devices, uh, and also the concepts where often we have to simplify things in order to be able to understand. But nature is very complex. Therefore, we always have some uncertainties errors, biases, if we deal with the analysis of, of climate data. And statistical science is uh, the language of uncertainty. This is, I would say, a must. It's essential for an um, applied researcher who wishes to communicate um, the analysis results with uncertainty measures, with error bars and, and biases. And uh, Therefore, we have to use statistics and time series analysis, and we use uh, computer software. So, Viljana has an implementation in R of uh, many tools. I myself uh, program in, in Fortran. Occasionally, I also use R. Uh, so, the, the software and the hardware, this is no magic. This is just a, a machine which helps us to calculate the things we are after at. And uh, as I said occasionally, uh, you will inevitably meet mathematical formulas. This is, uh, there's no way to do statistics without formulas, but this is a great stuff because they put us in a position to speak about climate in a quantitative manner. How much will change? What are the effects? Or how, how big is the effect of climate change? Not only is there an effect, but how big it is. What is uh, the effect on, on the Balkan um, heat waves? and compared to other places, for example. So, um, so this is a, the full philosophical approach behind the analysis of the climate data, namely a quantitative approach and also approach which, which communicates as fully as possible the associated uncertainties. And uh, the book has nine chapters, it's rather long, uh, over 400 pages, and it introduces you to, well, to climate and climate variables and also to a bit statistics. And then the second chapter, we speak about the memorizing ability of climate warm today or nice weather in Germany in Heckenberg where we are at the moment, warm also tomorrow. But if I look on the weather forecast in two or three weeks, there is no forecast because these are inherently uncertain, these long-term um, predictions over a couple of um, weeks or so. That means the persistence time, how long temperature here remembers is in the order of a few days, but not the over order of several weeks. And, and, and this we need to know the, this persistence, the memory of the climate, in order to um, calculate um, reliable uncertainty measures. And this is explained in the third chapter, Bootstrap Confidence Intervals, which I call the hardcore statistics chapter. So there we really speak as statistics. You get the, the formulas for the, the biases and the the, um, the estimators of uh, something. And then after these three chapters, we are in a position to apply the statistical machinery to, well, to certain estimation problems. Estimation means we are after uh, a property of the climate, which we believe it's out there, it's real. For example, a trend, linear trend, global warming. And we wish to understand uh, how big, what is the slope of the climate warming? How many degrees per decade or in chapter six, we would speak and we will speak about climate extremes. How many extremes are uh, occurring per, per decade or per time unit? And will this rate of occurrence of extremes change uh, in, in the future? That means it's a task of inferential statistics. We have data, limited amount of noisy data, data limit and noisy. And uh, we want to understand something uh, about the truth of the climate system. That means our inferential target, the occurrence rate and the other um, items of the climate, uh, these guesses are uncertain. And I will uh, tell you what can be estimated in chapter six on the extremes and how can we calculate the uncertainties. 
Um, so these slides, I, I left away chapter five, eight and nine, but the, we have also in case someone asks something about a correlation. But the focus in the, the red uh, corner is uh, the extreme value time series. So let me now, before I, we go to chapter six, um, go to ch chapter four, uh, be, because there is a, a way of um, explained how to detect climate extremes. Okay, and uh, so this is from chapter four, where we deal with uh, regression. And, um, well, Frida, what is the my My wife just came in. If my wife comes in, I always get, get nervous. <laughs> Uh, so anyhow, now um, back to, to science. We see here uh, in the upper right a plot of a time series, X against time. So the dots are the values, for example, temperature at um, um, Mitrovica. And, uh, and in blue is a, is a window which is shifted along the axis. And you can, for example, calculate the mean over those values, and then you would shift the window by, by one. And uh, so, so um, where is it on the mouse? So the, the, the leftmost point would go and, the, and the, a new point would come in and you would recalculate the mean. You would call this a running mean, which would be an estimate of the trend. But now um, in the course in chapter four, I, uh, I do calculate the running median. So we have in this blue window five points, the black points, and the median is the guy in the middle, and uh, this is uh, the, the, the red point. So let me sh see whether I'm able to show this. So this is uh, the, the median, and this is a guy in the middle, and this is extreme here, that one. And uh, the question I usually ask them to the participants, online or offline in my course, what would happen if that point is not here, but it would be over, over the, the roof of the house, this is the way I express it, which would be very, very much larger. And the answer, evidently, it would stay the same. The guy in the middle would still be the guy in the middle. Whereas if you had taken the running mean, and this value would be very much larger, also the, the mean value would be very much larger. Okay, that means the median is a robust measure of the location of a distribution where the bulk of the data sits. And it is very important to employ, if you speak about the detection of extremes, to employ uh, robust measures. Okay, that means we take the running median and not the running mean. And later in chapter six, we in a, in a few minutes, I, I show you how to calculate a, a threshold on basis of, of um, this uh, median approach. And by the way, uh, this brings me to a, an expression, an overused and I think abused expression, namely the word robust. Originally, it's a term from statistics. It uh, describes the properties of a method, of a statistical method. And it means that the method works well also if the assumptions behind are violated to some degree. For example, if the distribution is not Gaussian, it's a bit skewed uh, maybe. Still, what you get if you apply a robust me measure is uh, reliable, okay? That means uh, you can be pretty sure, for example, if you take the running median, uh, that it gives you a, a robust measure of the location and the median would not be a robust measure. And today, if I read the scientific literature, uh, people, uh, they seem not to completely understand what statistics uh, means here. Therefore, it would be perhaps an idea to, well, to think about um, using it in a, in a wise manner, the term robust. Let us now go to chapter six, the extremes. And, uh, well, I explain the data types and I invest some time here in this lecture on that. And then only briefly, I go on stationary models because as I said, stationary is obsolete. 
in these decades of climate change. Therefore, the focus is on non-stationary models. So a bit on, on, on data, because this is usually a, a, a very um, in, in important uh, thing. Um, well, maybe I, I show you one, one slide on, on, on the data, a, a picture I took, I took recently. It's, uh, I think it's here, yeah. So this is in Hannover Schmünden, a private Hanmünden in Germany. Uh, so this is a, an example of, um, of, of floods. So that means uh, the climate variable is runoff in a river. And at Hanmünden, uh, it's a special place because there two rivers join, the Vera and the Fulda. And after they have joined, uh, the river is called Weser. And the visa then mouths, it goes into the North Sea at, uh, at uh, Bremen. Okay, and you see, for example, I can't use the mouse, so I have to use it. This, this here is 1342. This was uh, the biggest flood event over the whole full history. So it's, a, it's a, a building close to the Vera River and also close to where they, they join the rivers. And you can see, well, 1909, 1890, and the water was higher at 1841 and so on. And there it appears, I have, by the way, I had, I think I have to, to check whether the building already existed at that time, but it's a very old uh, building. They used it for in the medieval times. So I, I think it's reliable. And you see that this 1342 event was uh, by far the, the biggest event. And not only at that river, in the past I did research on the Main River, which is a tributary of the Rhine. It come, flows, roughly speaking, from the east to the west and uh, via Frankfurt on, on, on the, the Main. Uh, and also there, 1342 uh, was the biggest flood. It happened, I think, on 24th of July. It's called the Magdalenen. Flute because Magdalene Day uh, was uh, well in the medieval times. People knew about the, the the holy people, so to say, and therefore it was clear. It was the twenty fourth of July, and uh, it is this is what I call the Millennium Flood, the biggest flood uh, in Central Europe, likely over the past thousand years. Okay, so um, so these guys. Uh, the, the, the people who take the flood marks, they already did a, a job in uh, detecting extremes. Uh, they did not evidently have daily runoff values, but they looked for uh, when, which was the date and what was the height of the, the flood. Therefore, we have already here a, a series of, of extremes, okay? And this is uh, the task to be done by, well, by the, the people. Okay, so we speak now about data types. And before that, we have a look at the, what I call the climate equation. Climate, X, comprises trend, linear trend or nonlinear. Then we have some noise component, scaled by variability function S of I. And then we have, and this is what I bring into the climate equation, um, I think it's a step beyond, if I may say so, what the, the fathers of uh, the climate definition brought. I say not only mean and variability, but also the extremes should be used to define climate. And therefore, I write a, a third term, the outlier or extreme component. And this is uh, the focus of, of, uh, of this talk and of, uh, well, of the climate extremes. And uh, this one we, we ignore. And uh, now we have a look on the first data type, event times. I just showed you for the case of the um, Vera and uh, Weser and the Fulda River at Hannover Schmünden, uh, the millennium flood, which was at around 1342. It could have been also this event here in case of the, the Elbe, okay. Uh, and there are other rivers. So what is this? This is time, the past thousand years, and this is magnitude. Uh, and this is a very rough uh, way of assessing how strong a flood was. So one is a, a minor flood, two is a, well, a, a bit stronger flood, and three is a, a very strong flood. And uh, I 
together well my colleagues at Leipzig uh, uh, worked on on this data set for the for the from a compilation by a self-trained climate historian Kurt Viking and I uh, helped them and we produced this Elbe flood record shown here only for the winter okay winter you have to know in hydrology winter there are only two seasons winter is from April uh, uh, sorry from November to April and May uh, sorry and summer is from May to October and here we only look on on winter floods okay and uh, mathematically speaking you take all from the from the time values just those that means those time values conditional on this vertical bar means conditional on if the outlier component is unequal to zero then you have these these uh, dates Okay, so this is a, a, a very simple um, data type, event times. In, in fact, you, it would also work statistics if you would not know any magnitude, you only know something happens. You still can do a statistical analysis as, as we see in a, in a few minutes. So this is data type one, event times. And then we have the second data type, um, and this means we have an ordinary time series on the, on the left plot. We see uh, the, the black line, which is, well, it's, it is warf thickness in a lake sediment core. So the lake is Lower Mystic Lake. It is close to Boston. And the researchers who drilled uh, the, the lake core and analyzed the data with the help of, of, of me, uh, they claim that these extreme thick valves are an indicator of hurricanes. You know, a hurricane not only needs, well, it originates in the, in the tropical um, Atlantic and it, it moves, well, uh, northward, northeast, northwestward. It may hit the United States and bring damages. Usually it hits uh, in, in, the, in the southern parts. Um, Alabama and so, but also here, even in the in the in Massachusetts, uh, farther to the north, it may uh, hit. So there exist historical documents, and um, so this is a long-term view with the help of a natural archive on hurricane activity in the past in that area. Okay, and the the this right. And plot shows you then again the running median I mentioned uh, uh, a few minutes ago as a measure of the of the so to say the background of the trend where is the bulk of the data and then we also have to use a robust measure of the spread how 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 la large is the distribution of that okay because our target is to define a threshold. The threshold, what is above the fresh threshold, is a, is a, a detective extreme. And the threshold has to be um, calculated also in a robust manner because we assume the presence of extremes. Therefore, we do not take the running variability, that means the standard deviation over the points here because this would be non-robust. If that point here would not be here, but there or on the roof of the house, variability would be very much inflated. But just because of the presence of this single extreme, and, and we, we use the threshold to detect this extreme. Therefore, we have to replace the running standard deviation by what is called uh, the running median of absolute distances to the median, MAD. This is the orange length. So we have one, two, three, four, five points. This is the median itself. Therefore, the absolute distance to the median is by definition zero. This is the second smallest. And this is the biggest. And this one is the distance, the absolute distance in the middle from here to the red one. This vertical uh, length, this orange length. And this gives you then a robust measure or two robust measures, one for the location, the running median, and one for the variability, MAD. And then you say running median plus a certain factor times the running MAD, this defines the upper threshold. And on the left plot, um, you see then 
uh, the orange line, which is the running median plus 5.2 times the running MAD calculated on well 2K plus one. That means an uneven number of, of points. Okay, so and uh, what I described here in mathematics, it would be that formula. Okay, why 5.2? Well, we, of course, you have, it's a kind of a tunable parameter. You have to play with the parameter. And uh, we found a good agreement uh, with documentary data. So this is a, a plot of a photograph of the of the of that lake. This is a, a length scale, and you see occasionally you have very thick waves, which may stem from a hurricane. And we also have well, uh, Columbus fourteen ninety two, and a couple of years later, uh, the, the Western people were in the, in the in the Boston area, and a couple of years later they began to make notes. So you have also from the Boston area documentary data. And once you have it, you are in a position to kind of tune that threshold parameter. And that brought us to selecting the value of 5.2 because then the agreement between WAF detected extremes and documentary data reported extremes, the, the, the agreement was best. Okay, this is a way how to proceed. You have different sources of, of information and you have to, to com combine them. Okay, and then um, there exists also the block extremes. Um, okay, the, the big thing with, with that it's easy to calculate. Okay, these are 100 year blocks and these are the extremes and it's, it's very straightforward. And also the mathematics for that is then simple. Okay, then we change the notation and we, we had that in, in, the, in the past lectures. The, the advantage of the block extremes is that uh, the distribution of these extremes, uh, it can be shown that it follows a, a certain shape. It is called generalized extreme value distribution. And uh, the, the big thing is uh, it is a very uh, robust uh, way to describe it because uh, you take the maximum of K elements in a block, for example, of uh, if you have daily data and you have, uh, you take, yearly blocks, annual blocks, not a hundred year blocks, annual blocks, then you have 365 um, data. And from those you take the maximum. And the, the big thing is that if you have many block elements and 365 is big, then the distribution of the maximum, it follows this shape, okay? So that the red shape is the density of uh, the maximum of a hundred normal uh, variants. Okay, so each you have a hundred um, um, normal distributions, and you you draw random numbers, and you take the maximum, and you wonder what is the dis distribution of the maximum. And it was shown in the 1920s that this distributional shape is right skewed. It's not normal anymore, and uh, the right skewness it is the GeV. This is a and therefore you have a very powerful machinery. You just take the, the block maxima, you should ensure that you have uh, enough uh, data points per blocks, and then uh, you have the, the GEV, and then you can calculate the distribution, then you can calculate the risk and, and so on, okay? And uh, this is a way how to fit it. It is called maximum likelihood, we ignore this. And uh, it also gives you the advantageously uh, confidence intervals for the parameters, okay? And then it, it's very uh, straightforward to do this. And also if you take the, the peaks over threshold approach, it also follows a certain distribution, the generalized Pareto distribution as shown here. There are two cases, one, one is with Xi unequal to zero or Xi is equal to zero. These are location scale and shape parameters. Also this can be fitted using maximum likelihood. Okay, and then there is in the book as well, it is shown in figure 6.2, a theoretical uh, example, a hypothetical example, some time series, uh, block extremes, and, um, and also the threshold exceedances, and then the densities of the, of the block maxima, the GEV, or the, for the pot peaks over threshold data, the GP. And, um, and this, tail probability shaded. This is a crucial parameter from a risk analytical perspective. 
effective because this gives you, well, the probability that something bad happens. And in this case, for example, in the upper it is 11%. And uh, for, for an outlier or an extreme value B being equal to 2.75 or larger. So this value 2.75 is called XP or return level. And one over the tail probability in the same time units as your time series is. So if that is years and one over 11% is nine, then you would call this is a nine year event. So nine year would be the average time you have to wait until a block maxima, maximum is equal to 2.75 or, or larger. So this, uh, you, you see that once you know P, uh, you have more or less everything you need, okay? And, um, and then we have this example from the Elbe River, but I, now only the summer, and why did, I did not use the winter? Well, the winter we treat in section 6.3, where we speak about non-stationary models, because I may remind you, we are here in the stationary setting. The assumption is the data generating process uh, has properties which do not change over time. That means the tail probability stays the same of the time um, and the return period and, and, and so on. So this is a very strong assumption, as I said. And indeed, I, I, I tested that and the, for the Elbe in summer, um, it's at the time of writing the the book, it was not clear whether it is stationary or not. At least I could not reject the null in hypothesis test that it is um, stationary. Therefore, I, I think it's legitimate to apply this machinery to, to that data set. But um, after, uh, so this was uh, published, I think in 2010, the book, the first edition. Now we are 12 years longer and then we have new floods, for example, June 2013 on the Elbe. And in my view, I think uh, we are shifting toward a non-stationary regime. We are also the summer floods became more and more frequent. So this is more an academical exercise here. Okay, this one we ignore and also the heavy tails we ignore. Because now, um, we will start in a minute or so on non-stationary models. So this was a, a quick walk through, through the data and through the stationary models. And you see that a lot of work goes into, um, into the assessment of the data and into the detection of extremes on a measured data set. And the, the other things I will uh, tell you now, uh, it's. It, is, it needs a certain amount of time to explain that. And you, I hope you are convinced that it's important to, to care for changing climate and to, to allow for non-stationary models. Um, but in, in, the, in the exercises, maybe you we do later or you watch me doing, uh, you will see this goes usually pretty fast. I, I just uh, press uh, the keyboard and I, I get the curves. I, I, for the estimation, but a lot of mathematics goes into and also a lot of uh, data preparation. For example, Igor Leshishin, who's he, here in, in, in my, my company at the moment, he also cares about a runoff data and he brought some data with him. And uh, I think he he sent an email to me and later we will analyze the data. So he I, I, I gave him the task of, of detecting the, the extremes in the in the in the runoff series, I think from Bratislava. We will have a look on that later. Um, so, okay, are there questions? Nothing um, in the chat. Yeah, uh, good. No, nothing. So let me. Okay, I make it uh, the screen with a uh, big again, and now we we proceed. Okay, you could be inclined to extend the stationary models, the GEV, for example, by writing a time dependence in the three parameters. So mu, the location parameter, and uh, sigma, the scale parameter, and xi, the shape parameter. You see here, they are not anymore constant. They have a, a certain time dependence, a linear, one case of sigma, because sigma is positive, you take the exponential of a linear because this is always positive. Then it means we have now six parameters, beta zero, beta one, gamma zero, gamma one, delta zero, delta one to estimate. It is um, now quite a, a job to do this uh, 
decently, um, but it can be done. And this would be then the maximum likelihood function to be well maximized. It can be numerically challenged. It can be done, I'm, I'm uh, sure, but you have to use good uh, software. But uh, keep in mind, this is still a, a rather a simple way, just a linear change. Uh, and, and if things are changing in another manner, you can't describe it with these few parameters. You would then have to invest even more parameters and things would be, become way more complex. And uh, therefore, I, I did not even attempt to, to do this. I found in the paper, so this was, so, so to say, my uh, merit that I, I looked into, into statistic literature, what has been done? What, how do statisticians approach that? So the, the typical data set statisticians employed, in, in really, they not all of them, my esteemed statisticians colleagues, they are so much interested in, in, in uh, what happens in reality. So they use uh, an, uh, a data set from accidents in British coal mines. Okay, so coal, okay, we are phasing out of coal, hopefully no, sooner than later. But you know, in uh, since 1850 or, or so in, in, the, in the England, we had many coals usage and uh, many coal mines and, uh, and therefore we had also accidents there. And uh, so there was a year without an accident and maybe then we, we have a few accidents. And so, so the, they were asking about uh, is a rate of accidents per decade increasing or, or not. So this is the, the classical data set uh, employed by uh, statisticians, of, of course. And I, I, I thought, well, why not apply it to, to climate extremes? Okay, this one we, we ignore because now we write what the statisticians write a point process for these outlier dates, a, a model for the time values, then something happens. Okay, and the crucial parameter is lambda. It is a probability, the chance, the risk that uh, something happens within a certain time interval, within a time unit. Uh, and since we allow for non-stationarity because of climate change, we allow for time-dependent variability, lambda of t. This is our estimation target now. So we want to estimate a, a curve, this lambda curve, the occurrence rate, the time-dependent occurrence rate. And so decisions worked out, for example, Peter Dickel in 1985, he showed uh, this, this approach. Now you see lambda hat, Head. head means now the estimate, the guess, based on data, on the outlier um, data, the extreme dates, T out. And you want to know lambda at a certain time point cap T. And you use, well, what is being called a, a kernel function, a window which is shifted along the axis. And if some points are inside, uh, the kernel uh, well, brings them in, so to say, uh, and then you count them. Okay, and instead of using, a, so to say, a, a, a uniform kernel where you can either be in or out, and if you are in, you get a constant weight, and if you are out, you get no weight. Uh, statisticians show that using a smooth kernel is better. It uh, delivers a smooth estimate, which is, well, I think it, it enjoys better statistical properties. It also looks nicer. It is easier to sell in a, in a paper because the reviewers will look at your figures and if you show nicer curves, it's just easier, it's better. Therefore, we employ a Gaussian kernel. Also, I should say it's easy to calculate it because it goes then via a Fourier transform. Uh, and then the back transform. Then it's very straightforward to calculate this because it can be quite lengthy if you don't uh, do it in this way. And the crucial parameter for estimating the occurrence rate is the bandwidth, H, okay? Uh, because it allows you well to, to see uh, fine details and H is small, small bandwidth, but few points are only inside. Few points inside means large statistical errors, but you can see details. Bias is small. On the other hand, if, uh, if the, the bandwidth is very large, many points are inside, statistical error gets smaller, but you can't see the details anymore. So it is a, a typical statistical um, dilemma problem, a trade-off problem. Uh, 
the bandwidth, the smoothing problem. We had that in the, in the course, if you were present in the past, also in other instances. And here we have it in the context of kernel occurrence rate estimation. Okay, then uh, we'll also, you use a Gaussian kernel and uh, that means it has a certain width and the, the interval stops here and the, the, the kernel kind of grabs into the future, but there are no events because there are no observations. Therefore, the occurrence rate would be smaller than in reality. It would be down biased. The idea is to generate, if that is a, the interval pseudo data in the computer in the future, and then apply the kernel to, to all of them, then you remove the bias. It appears a bit uh, as magic perhaps, but it has been shown to, 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 to work. And for example, Elbe, Winder, the last, <clears throat> excuse me, the last event recorded was in 1999. Well, this is when we did the, the analysis, we were sitting on the data in uh, summer 2002. Um, so this is the, the, the observation interval boundary. And the, the pseudo data rule reflection means, uh, well, 1999 to 2002 is three years. Therefore you go, the next event is three years into the future, 2005. And the, and the next one as well, it's a bit more in the future. And you have to generate a sufficient amount of pseudo data into the future that uh, you are always sure that uh, the kernel uh, has enough data there. So maybe three or four bandwidths because the kernel after three or four bandwidths, the Gaussian is pretty small. Then uh, you have, that means it gives you a handle on how much uh, pseudo data you have to generate. And, and also it's not an issue of, um, of, of, of uh, computer um, power. It's, it's just, a, it's done in a, in, a, in a microsecond, no problem, pseudo data. Um, Okay, and but for this data set, actually, we, we even did not need it because the two occurrence rate curves, the upper and the lower, the lower is with, the upper without, uh, they look very, very similar. But if you would have many events at the boundary of an observation interval, then uh, pseudo data generation would be important. Then we had uh, these, um, the, the problem between the selection of K, the smoothing problem, and what I described, the fight between variance and the bias, you can uh, put that into a mathematical form, which is called then a cross-validation function, the upper left curve, which employs then lambda index J, what is called a delete one estimate. In general, a, a delete one estimate is an estimate you get if you leave a certain number, the chase point uh, out, okay? And then, uh, okay, then you get the, the formulas and the more important perhaps is to look at the curve of this cross-validation function, Z independent of bandwidth of H, which for this data set looks like this one. It has a minimum at 41 years. And this gives you a, a good guideline on, well, what is a good uh, compromise between um, bias and variance. And you see, um, you should not take a uh, hundred years, uh, but maybe also not uh, five years or so. So somewhere in the area of 40 is for this data set a, a good choice. And to illustrate this, I, I showed three curves. So the lower curve is what we took for the paper. We took, a, we, we slightly reduced it. Instead of 41, we take, took a 35 because we studied also other rivers, the Oder River, which is on the border between Poland and, uh, and Germany. And, and we also did it for summer floods. And I personally like to slightly under smooth. So it's only a mathematical guideline, the cross validation. But you see, if you overdo it, the middle panel, a hundred years, way too big. You don't see these two peaks, it's just one big blob. You can't learn from this. And uh, if you go in the other direction, if you under smooth too strongly, five years, you see very many, many middles. And the, the bootstrap, the confidence band, the uncertainty band would render these wiggles as non-significant. And this is now my experience. So this is so this is the technical hint. Instead of uh, consulting just the, the, the cross-validation function, 
Also, um, the consultation of the bootstrap confidence band is a good bandwidth selector um, because it helps you, well, you should not um, try to claim wiggles which are not significant, okay? And therefore, if you do it for five years and you would get non-significant wiggles and you say, okay, it can't be shown, therefore I have to increase it. And then the bootstrap in a minute or so you will see, will attest that 35 years is a, is a good choice. And these ups, downs, ups, downs, they are significant. Okay, now we come to the, this uh, bootstrap uh, resampling. So the, the book is, a, it has in the subtitle, classical and bootstrap method. So the bootstrap is a resampling method. It is a robust in the sense that it doesn't assume a certain distributional shape of the noise component because it resembles from the data. Uh, and by that, uh, it has a, the advantage that it preserves the distributional shape. And this can be done in regression setting, in correlation and other fields. And here we see it in, at work in, uh, in the outlier extreme um, component. So we have our sample, the black bars, heavy Elbe Winter flood, 77 between 1500 and 2002. And we have also the, the Gaussian kernel plotted here. Uh, just for one point time point uh, at around 1600. It has a width of 35 years. So this is uh, this red line on, sitting on the bar chart. And on, on top of that, you have the occurrence rate curve. So independence on time, you have the number of events per time unit per year. So a value of 0.1 would mean one heavy Elbe winter flood per 10 years. Okay, and 0.2 would be two events, okay. Now the bootstrap. We take with replacement, what has been called a, a resample. So we have a number of points and with replacement, I take this one, then maybe this, maybe this one again and the third time and this. And then I do, I do this until I have 60 or 77 points again, okay? This gives me then the, the blue curve on which I re um, estimate the occurrence rate. And this gives me then this blue estimate. And you can imagine I do it a second time, the green, I do it 10,000 times. And then in principle, I could throw away the upper 5% and the lower 5% and in the middle for each time point would be 90%. Uh, so it would be called a 90% percentile band, but you see that there is room for mathematics. It can be even done better. And uh, it is explained in algorithm 6.1. We don't uh, need to go through that here. So there's a lot of mathematics. So statisticians really uh, tried hard to work out uh, better ways to, to, to do this. Okay. Uh, and therefore it is called a percentile T band. And the algorithm 6.1 has the details how to actually calculate this. So though it's a bit more accurate than just a bloody percentile band. Okay, so this would be the, the result. And for example, uh, this band would uh, allow us to say, well, at around 1700, the estimate there at roughly 0.1 is uh, smaller than the estimates at around uh, 1600 or close, maybe 1580 or so, and uh, maybe um, um, 1820 or so. Yeah, you see this increased risk, lower risk, and the increased risk. So this would be attested by the confidence band. It is small enough to render these changes as uh, significant. And uh, then this would be the result for the Elbe in winter. And you notice that I didn't plot the uncertainty bands for the values before 1500. Well, uh, you see a very low occurrence rate, very few events, but uh, we think uh, and we are pretty sure that uh, this is not because we had fewer floods there. Climate was dramatically mild or something like this. No, I think we, our data set uh, has uh, a bias here. We will very likely have missed the, the minor events. You know, printing 
in Europe at least, was invented at around 1450 um, Gutenberg. And uh, therefore, after that, uh, if you wrote something and it was printed, and it would, would be distributed very much often. And then uh, it, it has better chances to survive this uh, document. And the, then historians can pick it up. Or maybe also uh, Copernicus, who kind of was a big influential person, uh, on the development of science in Europe, I would say that people think about nature and uh, recording things. Okay, also Galileo, Galilei, and uh, Kepler, these are three big names, physics. Uh, before that, before Copernicus, uh, I, think, uh, I think he was born in 1471. Uh, people were not so much interested perhaps in, in nature and they had other things to do. They had to survive, so to say. Therefore, honestly, I, I believe that the values before 1500 are not really uh, reliable. But then, um, and you can check this also in the documentary data, if a flood happened, then you have often many reports which document the flood. And then, okay, you have to, best would be to collaborate with historians who are trained in the interpretation of uh, documentary data. Then you have to check whether or not these um, other reports are independent of each other, whether or not they just have one common um, uh, source. Uh, and therefore our paper published in, uh, let's back, uh, in nature, we had a hard time with the reviewers because they were a bit critical of, of, uh, of, the, the, of the data quality. More on that in, in a minute. Before that, I show you uh, a hypothesis test, which you can use in addition on that. So it uh, is based on a parametric occurrence rate model. So it's a, it is an exponential of a linear, okay? And if beta one in the upper left equation would be zero, then things would not change. So this would correspond to the null of a stationary climate. And if beta one is, positive, it would be increasing. And you can use um, that model and uh, calculate, uh, well, what is called a test statistics, a guide. If you have to decide, I tend to believe uh, it's constant and the other person says, no, I think it's increasing. And you have to decide one or the other, you calculate what has been called a test statistic. And the recipe is shown here, the lower uh, yellow box. And, and above the, the line you see on the left hand, the sum over the event times, T out divided by M. That means the average time when something happens, okay? And then minus, and then you have T of N plus T of one half. This is so the center of the observation interval. So you basically compare the event when something happened with the center of the observation interval. And if it's this or this way, it's either positive or it's negative, the, the, the trend in occurrence rate. And below the line, it's just a normalization because then the test statistic is standard normally distributed as shown in the lower line. U is proportional to, so this means in statistical notation, is distributed as, and this epsilon in the book, I use this for um, a, a random number with a certain distribution. The distribution is normal with mean zero and the standard deviation unity. It's very straightforward and easy to calculate this. And this test we applied for the to the measured runoff. So it's a German engineers and they uh, they measure the water stage and they make a calibration formulas between a runoff water volume per time unit. Uh, uh, and the, evidently, the higher the water, uh, the more runoff, and these calibration curves, they are important. And uh, why are they important? Well, it, also these calibrations are not a, a constant property of the river, because also the river may change slowly over time, especially if you have a big flood, then the sediment is transported, it goes away here, comes there, and uh, the geometry of the river at a certain place, a cross section, it may change. And therefore it is the task, especially after a flood, to update the calibration formula. And in case of the Elbe station at Dresden, this has been done in a, in, in a very good and very good manner and very often. 
So the LBIS is of an exceptional data quality in that respect. So we applied then and we, 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 we used the, the measured runoff data and then just the hydrological rinder. And then you have, luckily we had some um, overlap between the documentary data and the measured data that allowed us to place a, a, a threshold such that, um, well, uh, a, an extreme and a threshold to the runoff data such that um, what is above corresponds to what is reported in the, in the documentary data. Okay, and then we have uh, 40 events also and the tests named after their inventors, Cox and Lewis. Uh, it is clearly negative. The test statistic has minus 2.794 and the P value is 0. 0.0026. That means under the null, under the stationarity assumption, it is very unlikely, 2.6 uh, per mil, that we would have observed such a pattern of extremes as we have. There was uh, this, therefore the, the, the arrow downward. And it attests what we see already in the, in the, in the occurrence rate curve. We have a, a significant and a strong downward trend in flood risk for the Elbe in, in winter. And this was a, a surprising uh, result because, you know, we had in summer 2002, a big flood of the river Elbe. And um, yeah, uh, people were always blaming climate change for that. And, and then sometimes I have the impression that people are too fast in giving causes for this because um, runoff is based on precipitation and uh, pre predicting precipitation is way more complex than uh, predicting temperature. You have on the other hand, they're saying that, well, a warmer atmosphere can carry more water, the clausius clapeyron equation. Yes, that's true, but the other things change as well with the climate, the directions of the, the wind, and maybe also the, how the, the water is stored in the, in, in the soil and uh, many influences. We test, we test it also for other um, factors of, uh, which could have an effect on, the, on, the, on these trends, the ups and downs, whether deforestation or river engineering, dam building, reservoir building. I think the, these are all only minor effects. The big thing is, is climate. And it, because if you have so much water as came, for example, in August, 2002, there's no way to, to put it into the reservoirs. It's just too, too much water. Okay, therefore the, the big events are less affected by this uh, artificial river training network. I mentioned briefly that we had problems in the reviews in the first round. We were encouraged to resubmit and for the resubmission, we checked uh, another data source, source, namely by a real historian, Stefan Militzer, and this gives, uh, gave the, the dash line, the occurrence rate. And you see that within confidence band, it can't be distinguished from our source, the Viking source. Therefore, uh, we were quite happy that we got similar results and finally then the, the paper was accepted and that was out there yeah, now uh, 20 years ago closing. Okay, so this was then the, the story of the, the Elbe. And later in the, in the tutorial, in the exercise, we have it 10, uh, 11.30 or so, uh, you could uh, try to replicate this I hope, um, Biljana, that the people still have the, the software. Maybe I have to put it again on the, on the OneDrive. I, I can do it. Uh, and then you use the data and you can try to replicate this. Or, or in addition to that, we can also play with the data um, equal set. Then we can see what uh, Bratislava shows, OK? Uh, Okay, I briefly mentioned other things with the logistic models of Fry and Scheer, also a nature paper, very often cited. Uh, but I think it's, you know, uh, these guys, they work out uh, statistical tests. It's just a bloody test, whether or not it has changed. Can we refute uh, um, the null of a stationary climate? Of course we can in many instances. Um, therefore, I mean, a statistical estimation is more information. Not only uh, there is a change and effect, yes, but also how strong it is. Therefore, this is a big advantage. If you employ estimations, 
with con uh, con confidence band. It's more information than a, a, a bloody test. Okay, and then, well, we have this nonsense sentence, extremes are by definition rare. They are not by definition rare. This is not true. You can, no one in the world can hinder me to draw a PDF as shown here. And you see that you have zero chance of being in the middle. You have pretty large chances of being either on the positive or on the negative uh, extreme. So here, the extremes would be pretty, pretty likely. I completely agree, you hardly ever observe something in nature, but uh, I just want to refute, get rid of this uh, idiotic myth by definition. Yeah, this is not true. Extremes are by definition extreme. There's a second myth uh, mentioned in the book and we ignore this. And uh, so we are done at a quarter past 11. And uh, well, with great pleasure, I hear your questions. Uh -huh.